All right, welcome in everybody and cheers to Tuesday night edition, Tuesday afternoon. We'll just call it Tuesday happy hour because me and Steven are both enjoying some Bud Lattes. So grab a drink, do whatever the hell you're doing as you're wrapping up work for our Tuesday night kind of little college power hour where we're just going to give you our thoughts on some main topics that we see going on in the college basketball landscape. And then we got some plays always for you sprinkled in at the end. The show is powered by Pick City and Daily Bread Media. We're live on our paid for play channel as we let the college football fellas dominate that on Saturday. You'll see us there soon. But Tuesday nights, we're going to come in, drop out a few plays, just talk about anything college basketball related. So be like who you, be like Rory. Get into the comments. Let us know your thoughts. We were live two Tuesdays ago. Last Tuesday, Stephen and I attended the uh, Champions Classic where Stephen had a fun adventure home. So now this Tuesday, we're back at you. Next Tuesday, we might have a guest. So we'll get into it. But Stephen, how are you doing this Tuesday night or evening, whatever the hell you want to call it? You know, I mean, it's been... The, the picks have been just not good. Any any team I pick, loss. Like like they could be they could be dominating all game. They will not win. It's insane, but you know it's it's only the first week. I got be, what four or five more months to make up for it. Yeah, four for five months to make up for it. Good thing where most of this isn't college basketball gambling related. For out most of it, we'll give you our thoughts on some games and our teams, but. If we found a fade spot, we found that. I'm just saying, kidding. We're not going to fade you. But we got four main things we want to get into. One of them's a game. And then we'll probably give out some other plays and things like that. First one we'll get into. I know Steven was hyped to talk about this one. The West Coast Conference. Last season, we saw it coming, starting to come up stronger. Probably a base off Gonzaga being that strong. The teams in the conference are slowly might get better to try to have somewhat competition against them. But you believe the West Coast Conference could be a three plus bid league this year. Let's hear it. Yeah, I I like it. I mean, I, I obviously like I could never enjoy watching that conference knowing it was just going to be Gonzaga with zero competition. But like as the years have gone on. You like we've all known about like St. Mary's kind of making that run to be the number two team in the league. It's since BYU left the Mountain West and came to the West Coast Conference, they've also had that push. But outside of those three teams, the other seven that are in the league, really, nope, nobody hears about. Like they, like they're never able to take that step to challenge any of those top three teams. But there's two more teams specifically this year that I've seen early that can easily make a push to be that number two team over BYU or St. Mary's. Those two teams are San Francisco, who is already 4-0 on the year. Their best wins, probably their win over Davidson. They have a big game coming up against Nevada. That could be a big prove it spot for them on Thursday. And then the other one who's really impressed me probably the most is Santa Clara, mm-hmm. who already has a uh, a 16-point win over Stanford that even though Stanford might not be as good as they were last year, Stanford's still going to be middle of the conference in the Pac-12 and before Nevada or yeah, before Nevada plays San Francisco on Thursday, they play Santa Clara tonight at nine o'clock. I think this is a good spot for Santa Clara to prove themselves as a potential tournament team. This is definitely the best team they've had there in the last 10, 15 years at least. And I mean, if I had to make a pick on this game, I think I would choose Santa Clara, who's one and a half point underdogs, but have. Like, they're projected to win this game. So, you know, if I had more mm-hmm. of a model like you guys do, I think they, I think Santa Clara would be more like a one point favorite instead of a one and a half point dog. So I like them there. But I think that group of four teams is creeping up closer to Gonzaga's level. 
but also forming a real solid second tier out West in that conference. So San Francisco, Santa Clara, St. Mary's, BYU, all have the potential to catch Gonzaga if Gonzaga is having an off day this year. Like it's not going to be a cakewalk for Gonzaga to get through the West Coast this season. No, and I think San Fran, the Dons, San Francisco might be the one that gives them the most uh, issues of anyone down near last year and uh, golden second season looks to be much better, even though the 4-0, and they haven't really taken off any of that stiff competition other than Davidson. Uh, that fi- that 5.1 is going to look good coming back into it. Uh, the rest of their non-con schedule isn't that strong, so they're really going to have to try to take down one of the other teams in their second tier. I don't think they have a shot within Gonzaga. Their best one's going to come in their second to last game of the season when they host them. So that could be the only potential time is when Gonzaga is kind of sleepwalking at the end of it, getting into that part. So that would be the team that I think could make it a three-bid conference. I think either BYU St. Mary's gets an easy, BYU can get a nice win that we'll get into at the end of this get, uh, show if they do take down Oregon tonight. So a little tease there if we have some picks and angles on that game. But St. Mary's is the one team that, this offense keeps going in the wrong direction. Um, they're going to play with that extremely slow pace, which most of the rest of the conference does not like to do, which kind of gives them that small competitive ed- edge there. But in their three games so far this season, they played nobodies. Um, and they do have their strong part of their non-con schedule coming up with Notre Dame, Utah State, Colorado State. So they do play some tough competition with San Diego State as well. So that's kind of where their defensive metrics are completely skewed so far this season because they've been playing nobodies and their offense hasn't been showing. And that's my one big concern with St. Mary's potentially trying to make the tourney is you can beat up on the rest of this tiers where the bottom four or five teams in here. But past that, this offense might catch them with the second tier getting better. Yeah. So, yeah. So pretty much what I'm saying is there isn't a team close to Gonzaga's level yet. Like, I think if both teams play, like, if Gonzaga plays well against anybody in that league, they're going to win easily. But I don't I don't think in Gonzaga's mind they've realized that there is a second-tier forming that is better than what they're used to playing. So the only thing that would scare me off Gonzaga having a perfect season in conference this year is that they will be sleepwalking through some of these games and now some of these second tier teams if they have a good game can beat a sleepwalking Gonzaga team in conference. I don't know if I want to be bold enough to say that one yet. Chet's been basically built up what is proven his size hasn't shown in any of the games yet. That's just where even on these teams best day uh they might do a perfect one this year even though how much more competition it is and that might just pay off for Gonzaga in the long run even though their non-con keeps getting stronger and stronger each year. I mean, I don't think there's any argument why this team shouldn't be number one. Yeah, right now it's the way some of these teams are playing. And with Gonzaga already having that win over Texas, they should be the number one right now. Yeah, and then they can solidify it next Tuesday when they take on UCLA. And then Duke... They play next Friday, so definitely be watching Gonzaga Hoops next week because those are two marquee matchups to be watching for to see how, how how high up they are, and I think they take both of them easy in cover. Yeah, are you nervous for Paul at all, as we mentioned, Duke? Or is he – I think he's going to be fine, and he might miss two or three games. Oh, well, yeah. Miss the Gonzaga game. I can tell you that. Paulo will be in lineup for that Gonzaga game. Yeah, definitely. I was, I didn't, I didn't read that article fully. I mean, I guess if he wasn't driving, then there, there shouldn't be that much trouble for him. But, you know, I mean, they, they might, they're not going to give him what they gave, you know, ah, fuck it. I'm going to get, they're not going to give him what they gave Kofi, who, you know, if they, if they gave Kofi the same suspension they gave Mark Few. Then Kofi's playing in that game last night, and Illinois doesn't lose to Marquette. But you know what? What's done is done, 
And I mean, we'll see it in the records at the uh, at the end of the year. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, that was a good statement win for Shaka to get the fans behind him. That probably just bought him two or three seasons right there, even though they were without Kofi. Probably. So one that makes my heart happy in this part that we're going to get into is, of course, Porter Moser no longer there. So just a year, only two seasons late, but Loyola Chicago, they got the call from the A-10. If you have recent success in the tournament and get far and you're not in a power five, the A-10 is usually knocking on your door, not too far away from you. And Loyola Chicago got the – would you consider it a call-up from the Missouri Valley? I would definitely say it's a clear call-up just because how often does the Missouri Valley get three-plus teams that we talked about in the last segment? The A-10 can pull that with a little bit more ease. So I don't think – I just think it's for competition-wise, but – since I'm happy about this move, let me hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, I'm uh, – I mean, I'm not saying the Missouri Valley is a bad conference. The Missouri Valley is still a pretty decent mid-major. But I when, when you get the opportunity to move up to what I, I would consider – I would consider the A-10 pretty much like right below like the power, I guess I would call it six. Because you, you kind of got to add the Big East into the power conferences right now. So in basketball, there's really a power six. And then you have like the two conferences right below that. I'd call that like the Mountain West and the A-10. So if you get the call to go to the A-10 and you're not in any of those power six, you, sh- you should go to the A-10. Like it's going gonna, it's gonna to get you more money in the long run. It's going to give you a better chance to get into the postseason. There's really not that many. Like you have a better chance to get – higher rated recruits. I don't really see that much of a downfall for a team with the recent success like Loyola Chicago has. My thing is if they were just to slide in this season and just replace the conference schedule, I think they would probably be the odds on favorite, if not tied for St. Bonnie's to win it here because Richmond would be the third team that I potentially see pulling it off. But them just sliding in here, I think they can probably do it with a breeze and not have to worry about it. The one thing that I do see coming out of this one, it seems like St. Louis and Chicago want to make a rivalry out everything. So the Billikens versus uh, the fighting St. Jeans or sister jeans. I think that might be a good one to come out out of nowhere that we weren't expecting, but I can see those games becoming pretty tough. I just think it's probably the level of competition that Porter was probably had this maybe in the back of his mind. Maybe it wasn't any, he left for the upgrade, but maybe he was trying to get them out too because just the top six teams that we're talking about, the tiers, there's clearly tiers in this conference that's higher above than what we can see in the Missouri Valley throughout. Um, so that's just kind of where just from pure exposure standpoint, strength of schedule, everything like that, I think it's a great move for them. Um, will they have any type of postseason success? Because we haven't seen many of the A-10, A-10 teams since they've joined the conference make the late run it's usually before they've joined they made the run yeah that's always kind of weird but I, you know i think the i think the a10 usually plays a little bit more physical it seems like those teams that are able to survive and make it out into the tournament are usually coming in nowhere close to 100 percent. like like a lot of these a lot of these other guys can kind of skate through and get their guys healthy for the tournament like, doesn't the A-10 run up right to Selection Sunday? Yeah, they want to be one of the big boys. They take, like, the noon o'clock, the noon slot, and then the Big Ten usually goes at, like, three or whatever. Yeah, so you're you're playing that late and close to Selection Sunday against some physical teams where you're going to have injuries. It's tough to expect a team like that to come immediately into the tournament and have success against, like, some power five that probably got knocked out early in their tournament and has had like a week and a half or two weeks to rest and get healthy. But I think that's more of a scheduling thing more than it is a talent thing. Cause the A-10 has the teams with the talent to make deep runs. But that's the biggest issue is that the A-10 has always cannibalized itself. And then like a loss to UMass or Davidson or Dayton doesn't look that terrible from a mid-major and an A-10 perspective, but the committee takes those losses tough. And that's kind of where 
you'll get the separation that I think VCU is going to be a team that it, it hurts me to say it. I don't think they'll be sniffing March Madness this season because I think they're going to get beat up too much and their offense is going to take too long to adjust uh, with the injuries that they've had this season and the uh, parts going out the door. <clears throat> but Loyola Chicago, if they keep on the run that they're on, I mean, it could be just become their conference potentially, which is scary to say. Adding a new team and they just come over and take it over real quick, kind of like what Butler did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I I think but I think Butler probably should have stayed. It's not it's not like they look all that good where they are now. Well, yeah. is Loyola Chicago trying to do what Butler and Xavier did? I mean, maybe I don't. I don't. Not many people know that Butler joined, and it's gone now. Oh, uh oh! Wait, am I losing fucking service? Hold on. Don't tell me my service is going. No, my shit just cut out. I think we're good again. All right. Um. Yeah, I mean, I personally, I don't think Loyola has. Like, I don't think they're the type of team that'll look that far ahead to say that they're joining the A-10 to use it as a stepping stone to something like the Big East. But, I mean, if they come in and have the success that, like, Butler did and another conference like the Big East comes calling, I mean, they could – I mean, I don't, I don't think they would turn away at that opportunity if they got it, but I don't, I don't think that's what they went to the A-10 looking for. I don't know. I think it potentially was because they saw Xavier and Butler just do it. And I know Butler's time was just a year. And Xavier's time was 95 to 2013. But they got the calls pretty quickly. So if another Big East team goes out and Loyola Chicago does that, maybe we can pull back whatever the fuck I'm doing in five or six years. And Loyola Chicago goes that I can – uh Try to find if YouTube hasn't deleted our channel yet by that point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, I the, the only thing that would scare me with a team like Loyola just coming in and then leaving pretty soon after is that the Big East has an odd number of teams right now. Like, if they, if they had 12 teams, then they'd be solid, and I don't think they'd be looking for anybody else. And, like, the reason Butler left was because they were going through all that conference realignment with pretty much everyone so a lot of teams are moving anyway and i mean honestly it's getting kind of similar to that now with like texas and oklahoma leaving the big 12 and then like what is it memphis or no not memphis yeah well that's the whole football realignment again that's what usually changes it but this is actually a purely just basketball move for once yeah so for for them, it's just basketball right now, but with the American losing four teams and then having to like take six back, like that still affects all the sports. So eventually, I think, well, this is all shaking out. I mean, the A10 might be one of the conferences that loses a team or two to somebody else that's just going through realignment. But I mean, I hope not because right now they look solid. Well, the A-10 is always having people join in and leaving. It's really nothing new for this, uh, for it. I mean, Rutgers was in it at one point, Temple, Penn State, Charlotte, Nova, West Virginia. A bunch of teams have made some quick pit stops in and out of the A-10. That's the one reason why I think I can see uh, uh, Loyola Chicago potentially moving on, but it also could be a nice little – Long term, they're just so much, them and St. Louis are just so much further away from. I know they don't care geographically about it. Conference USA is literally all of the United States, but that's just kind of where the St. Louis and the Chicago trip are the only two that kind of don't make sense. All right. Yeah. Let's talk about the big boys. We got you warmed up with the WCC and the A10. So now you guys probably are ACC fans, and Steven wants to make you all feel bad about your teams. So why do you think, or well, I guess not why, <clears throat> who are you surprised at that's struggling? And then we can maybe go like back and forth one team by one team. And the not we're not going to run through all of the ACC, 
but you were saying that you're seeing the ACC struggle. So which teams in particular or what? Uh, I mean, I I think everybody kind of thought Louisville was going to be good this year. And, I mean, you can't – Furman's Furman's a pretty good team, but if you're Louisville playing them, that's still a game you feel like you need to win. Because when the committee's looking at your losses and they see a Furman loss, I mean, I don't really care if Furman ends up like 26 and 5 or whatever. They're still like the committee's just going to look at the name and say Louisville should not have lost to Furman. The same way they're going to look at Virginia and be like, like Virginia, like we don't really care if Navy ended up being good. You guys should not have lost that game to Navy. And then. I mean, this I, I this Furman actually kind of call Alabama. Furman almost catches or like kind of rattles off about that with the top schools. So that's kind of where, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, gonna, I they're just going to generalize it, but Furman's almost got that credibility, and I think does have that credibility at this point where Navy is a loss you can't have on your resume. Furman is one you can afford a little bit more, but not as much. Yeah, and then we knew we kind of knew Pittsburgh wasn't going to be good, but losing to the Citadel like that at home, even though it's the yeah, first Capel, game of the year, I think Capel's trying to get fired. <laughs> at this point, maybe. Um, like he, this has just been someone who I thought could potentially be high, and Capel turning it around has maybe this season he will. But you're sitting at zero and two, a Citadel. And a West Virginia loss, like, no, you weren't supposed to be close in the backyard brawl. But, like, it's your biggest rival that's in the non-con. You have to be a little bit more competitive than that. So that's just kind of where expectations where Pitt was going to struggle this season. But not, but but by no means was it going to be this bad. Yeah, and then even the way the way Florida State looked in that second half against Florida, they just got – absolutely beat up on offense and like i know i know that transfer from houston got in foul trouble early but still like you guys were playing them pretty much even for the first half and to end up losing that game by 16 like just just have a little bit more fight in that rivalry game if you really think you're a top whoa it's mike white's first one he's now one and six against Leonard Hamilton in his career since he got to UF. That was that was a big statement won by Florida there. And Florida's going to be a top 25 boundary team. So that's kind of where Florida State, I can 100% see where you said when Leonard Hamilton teams are asked to be tough and show up to the punch, it usually happens against Florida. And in the regular season, we've seen it come conference time. That's when they start to wither. So Florida State would probably be the only team so far I would disagree with um, in your teams that you rattled off. The, the first two, yeah, there's definitely cause for concern there. Louisville is, might be a little early for it, but I'm just not sold on Max philosophy and strategy within the ACC. Yeah, and, and I mean – At Cincy, an American, but not in a big boy conference. Yeah, even even to stretch it a little bit, like, I don't – I know Georgia Tech wasn't supposed to be that good this year, but you're losing to a Miami, Ohio team at home that's probably going to be middle of the pack in the MAC. Like, you're giving no respect for the slip-up games this season, Stephen. That's all I'm hearing out of this. I, I mean, not a, this a lot of these the a lot of these losses are at home, too. Like, Louisville losing well, at yeah, home. They're not going anywhere. Well, I guess UNC's technically going to Charleston or wherever tonight, but. Like, I mean, just home games against mid-major conferences. If you're the ACC, you expect to win those. And it's, I think it's more the amount. It's, it's not that they're losing close games. It's that. They're losing to teams that they're paying to come to their gym to play non-conference games. Like, if you think you need to pay a team to come to your gym to play a, a game of basketball, then that's a game you're what expecting to win. What about Missouri, then, in the SEC? What about Cal in the pack? Um, I'm just well, trying to rattle off. Like, I'm just trying to find more off the top of my head real quick. Well, I mean, we, we know Cal. 
You know, let I me know, preface this. Say, let me, let me preface this. this. I'm, I'm sorry, time. Mike. No disrespect, but Cal fucking sucks this year. I like if they have five wins all year, I'd be surprised. No, I know where you're coming from, and it just seems like the ACC just picked to get theirs real in early. But this isn't like not happening in every other conference. My thing with Georgia Tech is to keep it for like the barometer test for this game is going to be their rivalry match this Friday against Georgia. It's going to be at Georgia. Georgia Tech's going to be laying points here. I'm not saying that they're going to have to cover this game, but if they go in and have a uh, confidence win, then pass there is going to can you've seen what he did last season. He can rally them and it doesn't really matter how bad they look at stretches. He can, or it could just be a blimp, but he got them to turn on the gear. So Georgia Tech, I'd kind of be in the middle of a little bit concerned, a little bit not concerned from you, but you're like panic button on five teams in the ACC right now. Well, so you know, who, else is, who else is hovering over it or who else is smashing it in your opinion? Because it's got a lot more fun than I thought it would. Um, really, that's that's pretty much everyone. Like the only one, so only teams with the loss. You didn't even mention Miami, Florida. Yeah, well, no, that's be, that's because it's like you said, UCF's going to be good this year. A lot of these other teams that beat ACC teams, I don't think many of those teams are going to either win their conference or make a conference or make the NCAA. 95 points though. That's still a little bit concerning. It, I mean, they, they got into the foul game pretty early and they, I think, I, I think they made a better fight back than a lot of those other teams did. Like I, I ha- I was on UCF that game, and every time I saw them go up by eight or nine, and I thought the game was over, I would check the score again, and they'd only be up four or maybe five. Like that game even got down to like a one possession game at one point. So I think their one tonight is going to prove if they should be hitting the panic button because mm-hmm. if uh, if they slip up to FAU, which is definitely possible, because it's on the road, it's at it's in FAU tonight. That's where I think they they should be hitting it because I don't think that's a gimme like some fans are expecting tonight. You know, I I just think uh, I just think that if all let's see how many teams are out off two four if all five of those teams that like Pitt should have one loss they shouldn't have two and then those other four teams I think should all probably still be undefeated. I mean. Florida State, that game could have gone either way, but to lose by 16 is what worried me a little bit more. But I think all those teams should have either been undefeated or playing much closer in their games. Like, they should have all been doing that kind of stuff before Boston College lost. You just have like standard. We see how it is. Nah, so, like, they should have all been doing that before Boston College lost because Boston so College – why did you kind of only beat CCSU by 40? Or they didn't cover so why didn't UConn cover against CCSU? You know what? Uh, because Jordan Hawkins already out. We're already bit with the injury bug. It's tough. And we I covered our next game and won by forty five. So uh, all I, I just I, I don't want it to look like Boston College is any good because they're not. And with all these other teams losing, and people are looking at Boston College like they're three and zero. They're actually handling their business. Like they're not. They're not that kind of team. I think they probably lose. I think they might lose to Rhode Island in their next game. And if right. if they don't, Long they're definitely. Man, but so you called your shot on that one. Is there any team that you're sold on in the ACC before we switch into the next year? Hmm. Not. Not particularly, because Duke needs to shoot the three better than they are like they beat Kentucky that you're like yeah that's a good win but they they didn't do it shooting a high enough percentage for me Clemson I'm still hey hey look at look at that goose coming up with a good stats for me everybody said the Big East is down guess what we're up 2-0 right now so um but no I mean Duke's not hasn't impressed yet Clemson I mean, beating Wofford's not a bad win. North Carolina. North Carolina actually struggled against Brown. Vod Tech is the only team. I mean, Duke, I I can't discredit them yet. And Duke, 
and Vatek have been the two teams that have shown me it. UNC yeah. not struggling against Brown, but they still took care of it. And new coach, it might take a little bit of time. And yes, Virginia Tech has played a bunch of nobodies so far this season, but they've smashed whoever they came into. So that's kind of where that would be the two teams that I'm sold on. Yeah, well, I guess I, I guess I would say I haven't seen. I haven't seen an ACC team that looks like they can make a Final Four run yet. Storm Murphy might. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's back with his old coach, you know, running it back one last time for like the seventh year. Hey, that's why we love college basketball. <laughs> you have any thoughts on Rucker? No, I'm just kidding. I wasn't going to. On was Rucker? We can bash Rucker. Yo, Rutgers yo, they, they, they've been, they have not, they have not looked good yet this year. No, we're not bashing Rutgers. We don't, we don't do that to our friends. Let's get into the Phil Knight, the game of the not, – not the game of the night. Michigan versus Ian Hall is the game of the night. Maybe we can get Steven's thoughts on that afterwards. But let's get into BYU versus Oregon here. We got the four-and-a-half point spread. Um, the total sitting at 141. Doesn't have to be gambling-wise. What are you liking in this matchup? I, I'm I'm a little unsure. I mean, I guess, I guess the uh, I guess the two teams BYU's beaten so far this year are both pretty good. Like Cleveland State should be fine in their conference. San Diego State's going to be good in the uh, in the Mountain West, but Oregon's just a different animal. Like they they absolutely handled SMU, which. I was expecting them to win. I wasn't expecting them to win by 23. Like that that came out of nowhere. But for against BYU, I like Oregon here only because I hate Alex Barcelo. He's just that annoying white point guard who just wants to think that he's man, he's he just he's just a guy who when he's on the court just pisses me off to watch him play. But I mean, I think I think Oregon's got the team this year. Like, I the way they've been playing, they can challenge UCLA for sure. And I think a team that's challenging UCLA will be able to beat BYU essentially at home because the Phil Knight Invitational is played pretty close to Oregon's gym, yeah. if not in Oregon's gym. No, it's in Portland. Um, The thing that I see in this one is how the hell is BYU going to compete with the size of Oregon? And this just isn't talking about the power forward and center. Throughout the entire roster, how are they going to compete with the size? And that's where Oregon's going to make a living on second chance points. BYU probably won't break eight offensive rebounds, if not five, in this game um, when it matters. And that's just where Oregon's going to be able to dominate the flow of this unless Barcelo is able to slow it down that much because neither of these teams are going to be trying to play with pace. Oregon actually plays slower than BYU does. So they want to be in the half court sets. And BYU hasn't been able to hit shit from deep yet. Good luck trying to do it against Oregon tonight, even though BYU does have the solid perimeter game. This is just where BYU's relied to get onto the line for a decent amount of their points so far this season. And Oregon's going to shoot from deep for about more than a third of their shots, if not closer to 50%. So if Oregon gets hot, this game could be a runaway. I mean, I don't know how they're going to deal, deal with uh, Williams Jr. in the middle. Even though he's only six foot seven, that's going to be an issue. And if they just want to run out three tall guys with Gruyere and Kepnang, all three at the same time, that might be fun because I don't think they BYU doesn't have three guys on the roster that's taller than six foot seven. So that's just where when I think Oregon already has the advantage in the guard play, Barcelo can match up probably with whoever he has. But past that, I mean, Triore is all right, but he's more of a wing, which is where I think his size can easily be handled because Oregon's used to dealing with wings with size that can shoot. No, nothing new for him. And he's not a high usage guy either. So you just have to make sure that they close out on him. So that's just kind of where the four and a half 
it's just tempting to lay it here because you know I always like to try to back the dogs here. Mountain West Rex because, you know, other than A-10 Rex, those are my two conferences. I just think the Ducks just roll them here. You're on mute if you're talking. I, I hope so, but a lot of these a lot of these favorites have not been able to they haven't been able to cover the spread. It seems like a lot of these lines have been slanted a little bit more towards the dogs. Like even if a team takes a big lead, just those end of the games, nobody's really wanted to finish this year and just really like blow teams like especially pretty good to good teams. Like if they're losing, they're gonna come back in the game. So that would be the only thing leaning me a little bit more towards BYU. But uh, BYU's not in the Mountain West, so I will not be betting on them. Oh, shit. Yeah, West Coast Cup. Wow. Big mind fart there. My bad, fellas. <laughs> but, but that's good with Oregon. If you want to play Oregon slow game, that's where I don't think BYU's going to be able to handle it. Because if BYU had a little bit more pace, then maybe if you get – I mean – you saw what happened if you tried to get Oregon to run with you last year. It didn't end well for a few teams, but that's just where where BYU holds each of their advantages or where their strengths are. I just think Oregon's just that much better in each of it, which is more than four and a half points better. Yeah, I, I think I think they are too. Like I think I think BYU actually wants to play with more pace and San Diego State was able to slow them down. Like sure, BYU was able to pull that game out. But BYU doesn't want to win games in the mid sixties. BYU wants to win games in the eighties, and Oregon's not going to let them do that. So that's why I'm a little bit more afraid of the spread because if Oregon plays slow, it's going to be tougher for it to be a blowout. But I, I do think Oregon is just that much better that they're going to win, probably comfortably tonight. Yes, sir. Do you want to hit on uh, Seton Hall versus Michigan at all? Because I gave out my thoughts on that game on Daily Bread, but I can always give a redacted version. And a redacted yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that real quick. Trash. I know you're not going to say anything nice about Seton Hall, so I don't even know why I asked this question. I'll touch on it real quick, but I also want to. I also want to give out or ask an over under question. They weren't able to do it on Saturday. Does Rutgers break 50 points against NJIT today? If they don't, they should fold. I mean, they only scored 48 against Merrimack. If they don't, they should fold. <laughs> um, but nah, so in the uh in the Seton Hall Michigan game, if if we're talking about if we're talking about size, Seton Hall doesn't have the size to match Michigan. Like like this is this is this one's actually no disrespect. I don't think Seton Hall is all that bad of a program. I think they'll finish in the top four or five in the Big East. But Michigan's Michigan's just a different type of beast. Like Seton Hall doesn't have the guys yet to match a Michigan team this year. Even with Yetna, who's six foot eight senior, transfer from South Florida, Trey Jackson and Tyree Samuel, those are all three guys that are all 6'8", 6'10", 6'10". Yes, no, I'm not saying I think Hunter Dickinson can be controlled, but I'm just saying if they have to roll out size past those three guys, there's not much. I mean, Obaju's 7'2", but I don't think he's – if he's getting the court, it's usually not a good sign. But um, that's just kind of where those four guys, they do have a little bit of the size to be able to compete with it. Yeah, I think – I think Seton Hall is best to keep word, not saying they're going to actually control it or do great. Yeah, I think Seton Hall's best chance to come up with an upset here is what they have. What they have at guards is they have guys who are athletic with really long wingspans. If you can start jumping passing lanes and getting a lot of steals and turnovers and playing a little bit more up tempo, you can disrupt Michigan and you can find a way to try to. I think that's their best way to try to pull an upset because the way Seton Hall is built right now, you can't slow the game down and try to beat them with twos. You have to speed them up, get open shots, or hit threes if you want to get this upset. One of the wildest things so far this season, and sure, it's Buffalo and Prairie View, 
Michigan is forcing you to take long twos. Like when you look at metrics that break it down, it's only two games, but 43% is coming in the non-current version of playing basketball of layups or threes. So Michigan is being able to dictate the pace on defense. And that's where Braze Aiken is someone who I think can have the talent and is smart enough to be able <clears throat> to get there. It's just that he's going to need Yetna in a big way to step up tonight. And he's going to be the X factor if Seton Hall can compete and cover this plus eight. Um, I don't think I don't have any action on it. I don't know if they do, but that's kind of where if this is the game I'll have my eyes on uh, for tonight. Is there yeah. any play or anything you want to give out for the, people? Um, there's you only there's there's really only two more games that I'm going to touch on real quick. If so, Virginia's playing Houston down in Houston today. For for people who aren't big college basketball guys, do you think they would consider this an upset if Houston wins, or is that kind of what people are expecting now? Because you got Houston at five and a half point favorite. favorite. I was going to say Houston's a five point favorite, so I don't think it's an upset if they win at home. Yeah, but so I guess would it would it be an upset either way? Like if if either of these teams win, would we be surprised? Like I I wouldn't be surprised if Virginia slows the game down and beats Houston in a low scoring game. But I also wouldn't I don't be surprised. Think this game breaks a hundred points. Yeah, yeah. It was opened at one twenty three, and I was pissed I didn't bet it right away because it got all the way down to one nineteen. I don't know if it got down any further. I was about to say, neither of these teams are going to try to run at any point in this game. This is going to be a game where if you like old school college basketball and you don't like offense, you can enjoy this one. I'll have it up on the side because I need, because as a top 25, it's two teams that always can make noise, but that's the only way you have this one up tonight. Yeah. So there, there was that. And then the only other one. I'm kind of looking at is I want to see yeah. Memphis. UVA ranks 348 out of 357 and pay or 358, and Virginia ranks 358 out of 358. <laughs> Damn. Damn. But so there's that game. And then the only other one that I'm going to be keeping my eye on today, mostly just on my phone because it's only on ESPN. Plus. But I think this might Bro, be the six first. Bucks a month. This, yeah, this might be the first time Memphis kind of gets tested against St. Louis today. I, th- I think that game could be interesting. Like, obviously, Memphis has two top five recruits, so ev- everybody is super excited to watch them play. But, I mean, St. Louis brings back a lot. They're still 3-0. and Like, for them to be getting double digits against a – relatively young Memphis team that's not bringing back – like, they bring back some guys, but they lost some guys to transfers. They obviously bring in a lot of good freshmen. I mean, the veteran St. Louis team here could definitely keep this game close and have it real interesting at the end. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of where this game was at 12 and a half. It's now sitting at 10 and a half. I mean, I've thought about – backing St. Louis here, but I just don't want to be on the opposite side of Amani Bates at any point yet until I see any bit of weakness because we know Memphis's offense is going to be filthy. And sure, it's Tennessee Tech and NC Central, so tonight will probably be their first best test. But if you want to talk about teams taking care of business, 89-65, to 90-51, to 51, I don't care – who it is in Division One? If you win both of them that comfortably and that like convincingly, coming into St. Louis, it, it just seems like this could be Memphis's we're here statement game for Penny to get this boys rolling. But yeah, the double digit spread is definitely high, but I can see where it's coming from, even though I do have some respect for St. Louis. I just this team is just not creative enough on offense and relies too much on the team game for it. And that's just kind of where they can maybe lull Memphis to sleep, but I just think this Memphis team is too good because Landers Nolly's still there. And if you're just going to add these other pieces around him, and I was already high on this Memphis team, they're 
they're no longer the sleeping giants. They're here with Amani. Yeah, it's it's kind of where I'm thinking like if these two teams played in February or March, I mean it's it's it would be Memphis easy because there they would have the talent and the experience playing games with each other. I think what makes this game a little different for me is that it's Memphis's third game of the season. Like, like it takes time to gel with teammates like that, especially for freshmen. And St. Louis just has so many seniors. Like they don't, they don't need that time early in the year. They've been playing with these guys for three, four years already. Like they already know what to expect. So that would, that would be the only thing. I mean, that's the main thing keeping me off this game is I, I don't want to bet against the more talented team, but it's also tough to go against the more experienced team early in the year. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. That's basically all we had planned for you tonight on today's college basketball happy hour, whatever you want to call it, on our pay for play channel, part of the Daily Bread Media Network, as we said. On Saturdays, we, we're going to start mixing in with the football show, and we'll take over the Saturday mornings, what to be looking for, lines-wise, plays-wise. Tuesday nights, we'll keep coming with just some general sport, uh, college talk and then getting into the top games of the day. we got some good ones tomorrow as well. Maybe we'll mix in some future ones, so what to be looking for at openers. Rory, we appreciate you rocking with us this whole show. We saw you in here, so thank you to that. Roll back if you're joining in late, if you want to catch anything on what our thoughts on the ACC teams that might be struggling this season. Uh, Loyola Chicago coming to the A-10 and maybe some uh, sleeper teams early on in the season from the WCC to be watching for out in March Madness. But until next Tuesday, Stephen and I will catch you later. Yes, sir. I haven't. Uh, I don't I don't think this has been announced yet. So I don't know if I should say it, but I'm going to do it anyway. I will, uh, I'll be seeing everybody on this channel again on Saturday, talking college football with Sam and Goose and the guys over there. Yes, sir. So you'll get to see him again. I'll catch you all later.